Recorded. All right. Hello, everyone. Books with Banks back again, and I am so grateful to be joined today by Jannie Wirtz, the author of the massive epic Wars of Light and Shadow series. I'm currently only three books uh, deep into the series, so I'm still fairly new, uh, and uh, she was gracious enough to come on my channel and talk about certain characters in these books, uh, how much I'm loving the book so far, uh, and we will beginning this discussion. Um, Spoiler-free, uh, for the most part, uh, I, I do want to eventually go into more specifics, especially as they pertain to the uh, book two and book three, Ships of Marior and Warhost of Vastmark. Uh, sorry if the different cover types bother any uh, anyone out there that's collecting covers of the same. But uh, but yeah, for now, uh, mostly uh, just spoiler-free. Uh, and all that said, Janny, thank you so much for being here. How are you today? I am wonderful. Thank you for having me, Alex. It's a privilege to be here. All right. Uh, yeah, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, let me back up a little bit. Uh, I read uh, Master of White Storm probably four or five years ago, uh, which for uh, those of you uh, unfamiliar, uh, this is a standalone book that uh, Jenny Wirtz wrote. And I loved it. And I sort of read that as a is the style of writing, uh, are her characters, is this going to be an author I enjoy? Uh, because if I do, then I'll jump into something that's a series that's, I guess, currently 10, soon to be 11 books long. Congratulations. Um, but, uh, but yeah, and so then around that same time, I read the first book, uh, Curse of the Mist Wraith, the first book and the first uh, arc of the Wars of Light and Shadow series. And that was probably two or three years ago uh, now. And just this year, I've picked the series back up again, uh, reading the second and third book in the series. Uh, and I'm loving every, I'm loving the series every step of the way. Uh, so yeah, I, I guess that's kind of my journey getting into the series. I'm curious, uh, would you mind sharing a little bit about maybe what it was like writing that first book and then jumping from write, writing the first one into writing Ships of Marior and Warhost of Asmark afterwards? And what time well, period? Let me back a step up because you started with Master of White Storm and that's yeah. very interesting because I had the original ideas for this huge epic in 1972 and I spent 20 years developing it before I even sold the first book. And I sold the first book as a finished complete novel. It was not a partial. And part of the reason why I did that long delay was I felt there were so many complex aspects to this series. I really needed to learn my chops before I started. So in many ways, Master of White Storm was a dry run, writing a main character that you did not see inside of his head I've described that book as lethal weapon meets fantasy because the, the character is testy. He doesn't communicate. Um, it opens with him a slave on a gallery galley and he hasn't spoken to anyone for four years. So it was a way to study the legend behind a major hero where you don't see into his head until the very end of the book. So it was very episodic in nature because I thought I could sell it as short stories. That didn't fly, so I novelized it. But by the end of the book, it really definitely is a psychological look deep into the psyche of a legendary hero. So in a way, that set the ground for you to start Wars of Light and Shadows, because in the beginning, in Curse of the Mist Wraith, you come in like a cold bath of water. You do not see inside the characters' heads, except for a very little bit. And people have complained that there is no characterization or not enough, because you're seeing the characters actions more than you're seeing into what makes them tick ships of Mary or begins to open that door and tremendously deepen. And there's where all the characterization begins to blossom because there are more secondary characters to interact with. So starting from master of white storm, which had what maybe two major, major characters at the start yeah. three by the time the book finished, right. that's it um, to this huge epic, but it prepared the ground for you. So when I finally sat down to write this epic fantasy, it was time to get it going, get it on the major market. The major market was, I thought, ready for it. And so 1993 was when the first book came out and it's been an average of a book every three years. 
excluding the fact that I wrote to ride Hell's Chasm in the middle. <laughs> so if you look at it that way, 20 years of staging and planning, a book every three years to get the start to finish, that's not a bad schedule. People complain it's slow, but it's not a bad schedule. Mm -hmm. And the last books particularly were very carefully constructed so that it wouldn't lag, wouldn't sprawl, wouldn't. And the staging goes all the way back to book one. The tiebacks are so immense. So getting all of those little puzzle pieces in order and telling the last story, that last book with the precision it required took a lot of decision-making and care on the page. So, you know, what was it like? Each book had to carry certain things forward that the reader isn't going to know what they are yet. Mm -hmm. And it had to be done in the under layers of the story or the between the, the lines details or details that you don't think are important on the page to carry that story forward. The second thing I had to do was choose the scenes very selectively so that when the emotional intensity hits peak, I'm searing in an experience that you will remember nine books later, five books later, so that the staging of those early volumes sets the foundation. So when that huge impact of that finale bit at 11 hits, you're fully there on the page and it isn't, oh gee, I read that a long time ago and I forgot. Right. I had to make sure that the scenes in Ships and Warhosts were strong enough that you would not forget. Okay. And even in Curse of the Mistwraith, there are scenes in Curse of the Mistwraith that you might say, this doesn't look like it belongs here. Boy, are you gonna find out different when you hit the finale. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, sort of as you, uh, as you were explaining that and contextualizing Master of White Storm as a bit of a, a practice of sorts uh, at a certain character type or a certain way of uh, characterization, um, that got me thinking about companion characters because I think one of the uh, biggest draws of that standalone is the companion character uh, and his perception of the hero. Uh, and so that kind of leads me into, again, trying to be uh, as spoiler free as possible, but the Mad Prophet character in uh, Wars of Light and Shadow, I'm curious, or, hmm. <laughs> the, the way that you, introduce him and his connections, which characters, which main characters he's more or less drawn to in that first book becomes so important in books two and three uh, and just setting up that relationship. Was that always the plan with, um, with that character, with that companion? Uh, or uh, did he sort of develop as you wrote it along? Yeah. He came with... The territory. Okay. But if you look at the way the dynamic of a supporting character can work, when you can't see inside of the character's head and you really won't see inside of this particular character's head in Ships of Mario or until you get to Peril's Gate. And then you're going to get a cold bath of water. So when you're trying to do that using a secondary character to bounce off a character that you can't see, often it's, it's fun to pick an opposite. Like for Master of White Storm, we have a character that is so hidden, you really don't see to the core of him. But the one thing you know about him is he walks face first into his fears. Face first. Whatever, let the pieces fall where they may. And his sidekick character is scared of his fears and never truly overcomes them. So everything of his opinion of this other main character has to do with the fact he's running from his fears. So in the case of Dakar, he's running from his talent. Mm -hmm. He's uh, doesn't want to apply himself, doesn't want to take responsibility. He's offset by a character that you can't see into his head, but is the epitome of his opposite. If you think about it, this other character has been trained hit his mastery at a very early age, plays his cards very tight to the test, absolutely does not run from responsibility. It destroys him inside. The responsibilities he's forced to carry destroy him inside, but he does not run from them. So 
Dakar's character is a reflection of an opposite. And of course, all of his opinions will be wrong. <laughs> because he's going to see through that lens of his own flaws, just as we as human beings see through that prism of our own flaws. And most often, the finger we point, there's four pointing back right back at ourselves. All right. Uh, thank you. Um, I I don't have too much more non-spoilery stuff to say, uh, but I will say that uh, anyone watching this who hasn't read uh, this series, uh, I highly recommend um, checking out uh, Curse of the Mist Wraith. Uh, that's book one. Uh, it's wonderful. And then book two, just in my opinion, it deepened everything. Uh, book two and three um, deepened everything. And all of the themes, uh, even themes that were just hinted at in the first book, get much more thorough explorations, I feel, in the next books. and Which kind of makes me even more excited to, not kind of, it definitely makes me more excited to move on into the third arc, because I can only assume a similar thing's going to happen again, uh, a similar tra transition. Uh, but yeah, uh, so thank you all so much uh, for joining. Well, so we can say a little before. more here about the arc oh, yeah. structure yeah. of the series yeah, that's sure. not yeah. spoiling. The first book really sets the stage. The second two books, which were written as one novel, originally Warhost of Asmark and Ships of Maria were one story. And even though it has a pause point in the middle, to get the whole impact of that, you need to read both back to back. Those two books absolutely cement your investment in the conflict and the characters. So it's going to set that stage wider so that you have a heart deep connection with those people to carry you forward into arc three, which is going to lift it to worldview. Then you're going to see where all the various factions are coming from and all the mistakes you made with the assumptions that you thought this or that or that was the real moral high ground hero. That was the reason these people were doing something or even that was the reason there was a monarchy, which isn't really. You're not going to be in Kansas anymore. That is setting the stage for arc four, where you're really delving into stepping outside the envelope and why this world is truly different. So it's very carefully staged to bring you up to those levels without leaving you behind. So by the time you get to, we're not in Kansas anymore, you're invested in not just the characters, but the worldview. You care about what happens on a very broad stage until the finale, arc five, when the elder powers step on board and you realize, oh my God, they've been here all along. They just walked really, really softly. <laughs> Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so yes, uh, now official spoiler warning. Uh, and I, I'll have this marked down in uh, the description too uh, when, when we shift over. Uh, but uh, to pivot more into talking about specific plot points and especially characters of ARC 2, uh, it would be a little bit impossible to do so without giving away the way certain factions break down at the end of um, ARC 1. Uh, what Arathon and Lysayer, what their positions are, who their companions are. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, uh, full, full spoilers up through um, Warhost of Vastmark uh, from here on out. Um, yeah. Uh, is, is there anything that uh, you'd like to say maybe more in, a, in a more spoilery context uh, to describe uh, this arc and how it stands out from the other ones, uh, this specific story kind of told across these two books? Well, in broad and general terms, there are two major viewpoints being played with here with the two main characters who are at odds. One is an extrovert and takes the extrovert's view of how to fix the world, do what's right for the many and the heck with the few. The other one is the introvert who looks more one-on-one, -on -one, do what's right in the moment and let the bigger picture fall where it may, because everything you need to know is contained in that moment. So I don't know how to describe it in any more um, bigger terms than that, but you, I wanted the feeling in arc two, there but for the grace go I. If you had not known the other side of the story, you might've fallen for the big line that Lysair presents. And this is true of the world. You're only as good as the information you have coming in. And so people complain. They thought, 
oh, I was writing a story in which you're going to equally balance both sides. Not necessarily. There will be moments where you might like what one side is doing and you hate what the other side is doing. Or you might, your, your position may reverse. I was setting to show what the thinking was and the flaws in the thinking behind one side. But what you need to realize is you are seeing the other side that most people don't know. And that may change your opinion. Hold on a second. Don, right, yeah. you get that? <laughs> so um, you might have to change your opinion, but it wasn't supposed to be. And if you read the prologue, it's shaded to indicate that this other side of the picture affected what you saw. Right. And too often, we only see the side of the victor. We only see the side of the extrovert. We only see the side that the news gives us. We don't see the small things. We don't see the things that are unspoken of. So this series explores two sides of a conflict. And I wanted that scary feeling of, if I did not know what the other character was doing or what the other side, how that event occurred actually, I might have fallen. I might have become the tool of the mass movement unwittingly because my moral assumptions were hearing what I wanted to know. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's very dangerous when the news gives you what you want to hear. Did it tell you everything? <laughs> and there's where the big split of these two characters occurs in Warhouse when Doc Hark realizes he has that epiphany in that moment that Lyser binds people to him by telling them what they want to hear and he basically fosters their weakness. So when they walk away from that, they're not feeling secure or strong. He plays on their fears. He plays on their faults. Whereas the other character pushes people away and forces them to stand on their own two feet. And it's not necessarily a happy journey. Right, right. I, I, I particularly love how those ideas are sort of explored through different characters, individual reactions uh, to the propaganda and to the story that they're getting. Uh, in particular, um, characters like uh, Tharik or Jeunesse. Um, and I guess Jeunesse maybe comes first because we meet her more I guess she's more central to things earlier on in Ships of Marior, um, and Tharik doesn't really start to shine until Warhost. But um, oh, sorry, I'll but, uh, you can keep it if you. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, I uh, I guess maybe to talk about Jeunesse a, a little bit. Uh, so she's uh, this single mother uh, of two and living in the small coastal town of Marior and that Arathon comes to in ships of Marior. And uh, I'm curious what your thought process was behind creating her specifically within that setting, maybe just the setting itself uh, and uh, just certain decisions you made with her character. For instance, she is one of the only ones in that town who has more of an idea of who our protagonist actually is. Uh, so just decisions like that. I, I'm curious why you why you chose to make her the way that you made her. Well, she's a widow. She lost her husband at sea. She's definitely afraid she'll lose her children. She lives in a fishing village. And if you talk to people who live on the water, whose husbands go to sea, it doesn't always end well. And where, what other profession does she have a choice for her children than that or to send them away? So her attitude is to keep them safe. And she is in a way a foil for Arathon's character because you don't see into his head, but there's that moment where she decides to push him to see if he's really got this criminal nature to get him to show more of himself and there's that moment where he closes himself off to her, where they're, where they're on, on the little sloop that he's launched and he took her away to show her that the sea is not your enemy. 
mm -hmm. you need to face that fact and you need to let your children be independent and grow without your fears on their backs. And she pushes him to find out more. And there's that moment where his disappointment hits him and he shuts himself off to her. Why? Because he gave her his genuine self. And this is, you don't see into his head, but you do see his actions. You do see what he does. You do see that he exposes himself to her deliberately. He lets her know who he is so she can make her own decisions. She chose not to run away, but then she pushes to say, how do I know I can trust you? And his attitude is, I've shown you by my actions. So there's that moment where he closes himself off because he gave himself the best that he had and she chose not to trust. So that says something very, very basic about how this character operates. And it says something very, very basic about her being unable to trust what she sees. She would rather step back into her fears, step back into her insecurities, then step forward and say, this person has acted with integrity start to finish. Maybe that's who they are. And how often do we see that also in our lives where the person may not look like what we expect, they may not be what we expect, but their actions speak to who they are. Too many people look at the surface impression and don't look at what the hands are doing. Mm -hmm. And so I was playing with that concept of look at what the character does because that says who they are more than anything else. Where do they place their integrity? And so in a case where the character doesn't tell you, which is more trustworthy, them telling you that I have all this integrity, is it really right. there? That flips back to Lysair. Look at all my integrity, right? Right, right. The one that doesn't want it, but says, look at my actions. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, well, uh, and I mean, just thank you for that character. I was... I was so fascinated by her reactions to how hesitant she was to get close to him in, I guess, the first half of this arc. And then because she sort of puts that wall up again, despite being shown his true kind of nature, she puts that wall up again. Uh, my read on it was it's still, she can't let go of that um, protective kind of, maybe overly protective feeling she has of her children. Uh, and so no matter what, she's not going to ever really warm up or trust Arathon. She, she sort of missed her chance to, to kind of, uh, to, to get there, to, to cro cross that bridge. Would you say that's an accurate read of, of that kind of moment where it's a little bit too, too late for her to really be an ally of his anymore. Not that she's like a, a friend of Lysayer. I, I I don't ever think she thinks, oh, Arathon's great. Betray or Arathon didn't Lysayer. tell, yeah. She did not right. tell Lysayer where he was. Right, right. But the, the fundamental issue was her children. She was still trying to tie them to the apron strings, keep them safe, wrap them in swaddling. And he broke that. He broke that. And you're not going to be done with her. She will appear in arc three. And so will those kids. Oh, great. So will those okay. kids, absolutely. And are her fears valid? Maybe they are. You know, there's arc three to play out the rest of that story. But once again, how many parents do you know who cannot let their kids develop to their own strengths and talents? Instead, it's like, I'm afraid of this and my kid better had be afraid of it too. And they smother them very, very early. Mm -hmm. They smother what talent they have. They smother what individuality they have. They push them back into the box. So to me, Janess was the parent who could not break the box and let her kids out of her setting. And the kids broke out and Arathon gave them the means to do it. And it mm -hmm. did not turn wrong. But if you look at the contrast between Janess who lost her husband, and you look at Haliran's daughter and mm. aged mother, that one never let her daughter out of the apron strings, and look how that turned out. Uh -huh. House full of bric-a-brac where you couldn't even move 
because the walls were so tight and so closed in. So even though this story is about the main characters, the side characters have pretty big stories to tell as well and pretty big statements to make about our shortfalls is human nature because it's your parents' desire to keep your child safe. But once that child is raised, you have the strength to let them go. Mm -hmm. Come whatever may. Right, right. Well, I mean, that's great to hear that um, That I'll see more more of uh, this particular family unit. Although I, it, there is, does seem to be a bit of a tease of that, uh, I believe, it, at the end of Warhost, um, Arathon's on a ship with uh, Phelan, uh, I believe. She's or... serving as his navigator. Right, right. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm just very excited to see where that goes. Um, but I, I guess you... By that point, by the end of book three, you've already built the reader's faith, uh, I think, in if we see some scenario sort of start to play out, we have total uh, confidence, I guess, that it's going to come back around and continue continuously impact the story in some way, shape or form um, because of characters like or because of what you do with a character like. Uh, Tharic, who the first time he came back into the story, uh, I think was in one of those little kind of uh, excerpt or, or like uh, chapter kind of ending segments uh, where you just described that an angry guardsman from a town that felt he had been embarrassed by Arathon and, uh, and Arathon's the reason he's been fired. Now he's marching south to get his revenge. And I, I, when I read that the first time, I thought, this is interesting because we didn't really meet this character or know, get to know too much about him. Is he going to be important? Is he going to matter really? And, but then of course he does. And I, I just, I mean, starting book three, um, I guess it's not the first chapter, but the second chapter is his story is what happens when, when Tharik comes to the small town of Marior uh, to get his revenge and, the emotional journey he goes on. And I, I was just, I guess, uh, similar to uh, asking you how you wrote Janess and what you were working on uh, there. I'd love to hear the story kind of behind how Tharic came to be. And then of course, I, I'm not just, um, if anyone's just watching this and they uh, and you haven't read the books and you don't mind spoilers, um, these characters, connect like they there there's a link between them i'm not just picking two random side characters uh but yeah i just curious well you did see Tharic because he was the guardsman getting punished by the sabridian for letting right. Arathon into the armor right right so he not only gets tossed out on his ear he loses his entire career he's cashiered basically so yeah he goes and he burns down Arathon's shipyard that's heartbreaking and this is you knew how much Arathon put into that heart and soul to build those ships. And this is a classic case of you don't see into the character's head, but you do see how he reacts. So this guy burns down the shipyard and all of the shipyard workers abuse this character for doing that. Arathon does the opposite. And he says pretty much to Dakar when Dakar goes, why are you doing this? He said, when you treat a man like an animal, don't be surprised when he acts like one. Mm -hmm. Because Arathon is accepting the responsibility of this poor man got blamed for the break-in of the armory. It's a cascading effect of what occurred in Alestron. So what does he do? He doesn't kick the guy out. He doesn't, he pushes him to stand up on his own feet and discover his own life. And he does it in a very distant way, not by binding him to him by his faults. It's like, don't be loyal to me. Stand on your own two feet, make your own choices, earn your pay and choose what you're going to do from here forward. And you will see more of Tharic in the third arc. In fact, all those shipyard workers, okay. you will see them again, even if they're just an unnamed character in this book, they will come back around and come back around and they will play increasingly bigger roles. So how do people respond to somebody that injures them when that injury had its roots in something you actually did to them? Mm -hmm. So there's very complex threads running through these secondary characters. And 
it gives you another chance to see Arathon's response to something not being necessarily the standard one you see in fantasy where, oh, you wronged me, I'm out for revenge. Right. I don't like that theory. I don't like revenge as a story premise because it's just an excuse to take violence and make more violence. That's all a revenge story is. It's about making violence. Mm -hmm. And that is not a solution. So continuously through ships and war hosts, I'm seeing the tables being flipped, where what if you choose a different option? You don't have to take the one that's always on the board in your face because that's how history has carved it out. What if you took a different path? What if you did something different? And given this character's ability to take the farsight he's got from his mother, plus his initiate training, he's going to look at all the different paths. You saw him, you saw him do that in, Ship, in Curse of the Mystery. He explored all the options. They were all bad. Sometimes you can't take any but the least bad option. So here's a character that's going to look for a different path forward every single time. And I'm laying that down without doing it like this character always looks for a different path forward. Right, no. right. <laughs> it's written in the actions. And those stakes are going to get bigger and bigger as the series goes on. And that's part of the fun of writing it is I cannot and a predictable book. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so while I borrow off some common tropes to begin with, one by one I break them. I mm -hmm. smash them to pieces. So what looks like a classic fantasy at the beginning, where's the big dark evil? Well, there isn't one. Uh -huh. There's yeah, I, I mean, yeah, in this world yeah. that are contentious, but there is no big bad evil. And we're not going to have a big bad war to stomp out the big bad evil because... We know that wars don't solve anything. They well, just pass it to the next generation. Yeah, I mean, I'd say if there is a big bad evil of this arc, it's propaganda, which is a much more real world. Um, well, may maybe not even propaganda because I'm not sure how. Um, it's just, it's the self-justification, narrativization of one's own heroic story, of like Le Sarah's own heroic story. Um, that I don't even know if he buys into 100% of all the time, uh, as much as uh, some of his, uh, like his uh, uh, commander buys into it, maybe more than Lysera actually does. Um, but um, I, yeah, I, I guess I didn't mention this earlier, but another side character we could talk about uh, important in these two books is, uh, is it pronounced uh, Deegan? Deegan. Uh, commander Deegan. Deegan, yeah. Um, he is, I, I mean, I know I just said he seems to buy into the whole uh, Arathon is evil, I say or is good idea more than probably anyone else. However, in Ships of Mary, at the beginning of Ships of Mary, or um, we see he is seems a little bit reluctant to even like, or in. Uh, Lysayer's plans to go halfway ac or across the entire continent and saying, well, why are we doing this? This doesn't make sense, but he's loyal. He'll, he'll work with him. And then only over the course of that book, he comes to, I guess, just, just fall head over heels um, for this cause, this self-righteous uh, kind of cause. I'm curious um, about the process behind his character as well. Well, if you look at his, beginnings in Curse of the Mystery, he comes from a very socialite culture. It's, and they have their conflict with quote, the barbarians. Mm -hmm. So he's a product of his culture. He's very shallow. Yeah. And one of the things that I don't like about fantasy is when characters encounter a major war or a major scene of carnage or a major shift, and then they come back around and they're the same person afterwards. Right, right. Deegan had a shocking awakening at Tau Quarren. He couldn't have imagined the defeat that he was going to face. He couldn't have imagined the death toll that he was going to face. So it's pretty logical that he would buy the excuse that Lysa presents him with, which is, you are now fighting a great evil. Mm -hmm. So he's taken this shallow person and molded him into stand up for a grandiose cause. And Deegan becomes the character who falls prey to hero worship. 
He falls for Lysair as the big savior. He falls hard for the charismatic character. They're people that you meet and you just can't help but like them because they present you a likable front. They don't challenge your assumptions. And mm -hmm. where did Lysair challenge Deegan's assumption? He didn't. He led him to exceed his shallowness and become actually the commander at arms that he was foppishly playing at in, yeah. in book one. So here's a character that felt prey to hero worship. And then from hero worship became the sycophant who's going to protect the human side of the hero he is worshiping. So you see at the ending of ships, he actually has the character assassinated that was telling the truth because he didn't want Lysair's cause to be weakened. He was protecting Lysair and that continued behavior led to the debacle at Bassmark, which could have been stopped. Right, right. So where did hero worship, where does it lead a person? If you want to justify your flaws, you'll tell yourself a story that makes your flaws comfortable. And if you don't want to step aside and break your assumption where something you believed intensely personally isn't working anymore, and if you're not willing to break that down and start over again and build up another foundation, which may have to get broken again, okay? We're only as good as the information we have. Mm -hmm. What happens when the character fails to rise up to my assumptions are broken and what am I going to build? If you build it on justification, what do you get? An amplified mistake. And Deegan mm -hmm. epitomizes that. His protection of Lysair actually destroys the campaign in Bassmark. Yeah. Whereas Arathon shoves away Tharic and says, do not hero worship. Do not do it. Forces him not to. Don't build up false assumptions. So you're seeing the two characters act in opposite ways, but very human ways. And when you break apart any conflict we've had in history, how much of these factors are pushing and shoving? Where do we get the bully? And where do we get the great heroic defender? And how did that bad dynamic get sown? Because justifications justify the bully not breaking down their assumptions and starting over again and saying, you know, maybe I was wrong. So as we get older, does it get harder to admit that you're wrong? And how were you brought up? What happens when you admitted you were wrong when you were young? Mm -hmm. Did you get smashed for it or did you get... so? We build these aggregate shells around ourselves and they actually impede the truth. And the truth changes as we grow and break our assumptions. The truth is never constant. So ships and war hosts really play with that. What happens when you stand forward and confront that the truth changes underneath you? Or what happens if you stand back mm -hmm. and try to justify it? Right. Fun story, lots of humor, but there's majorly right. things running through it. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, it, with the humor, I mean, just look no further than uh, the Mad Prophet, uh, Dakar, and, but also with the heavy um, kind of thematic elements, uh, specifically with Warhouse. I'm not sure we got too much into his deeper thoughts on the situation in ships of Marior. Uh, but by the time we get to, I'd say, I'd say even with the song that um, binds or that, that lets Dakar more into Arathon's mind. Um, I'd say starting with that scene, the co comedic relief character starts to enter the same transformation or maybe trial that all of these supporting characters are going on um or it, at least it seems like that to me they're going on to see which ones are going to buy into their own assumptions uh which ones are going to grow and evolve uh Dakar was a little bit outside of that he was just drinking and he was just hating that he was tied to uh this one guy and not the more fun brother um, but now he's sort of thrust into a situation where he has to, he has to pay more attention. Maybe I, I don't, would you say that's a, well, oh, the death of the child, right. the death um, of the child in Vassmark mm -hmm. absolutely shook him to his core because 
his own shortfalls caused that scene to fail. He mm -hmm. could not save the child because he was irresponsible. He had flaws. He never faced them. And nobody was going to condemn him for that. He did the best he could in the moment. Isn't that what Arathon said to him afterwards? You were the best man mm -hmm. you could be in the moment. But Dakar had to face the fact that prior to that, he had not been the best man he could be in the moment. So you see that moment where he comes out of that losing that child and then having to face the grieving parents. And you see him start to harden and build that shell that Deegan did. Mm -hmm. Where he says, well, either everything I saw was real. Arathon really put everything out to save this little girl. Or he's a total criminal. So it's the same argument Lysair used in Atara when he saw Arathon making the shadow ships for the children. Uh-huh. He had to be a terrible criminal, and this all had to be a dupe, right? Right. Right. So right. Dakar is sitting here on the line, either or. And so Dakar right there and then and there sobers up. He stops drinking because he says, I have to determine which way this goes. I'm going to watch you like a hawk. I'm going to make sure that you're not. And then you see all the unwinding of what occurs in Warhouse and where Dakar finally realizes it is when he sees Lysair again. And the first yeah. thing Lysair does is say, go get drunk. You look like you need it. Play right. Faults. Saying, go back to being the ne'er-do-well. Go back to being whatever you were before. And Dakar can't do it. That's the moment where he really realizes he can't go back to being what he was. So it started with the death of that child. So the, the shell he tried to build was too fragile. He didn't go into hero worship. Arathon did not encourage it. But neither could he go back. The death of that child was too searing an experience. So it opened his eyes, but he didn't really admit it until that moment when he took the arrow. Mm -hmm. That was the moment when he realized I can't be the scapegrace anymore because everything to do with coming up to this moment was Dakar's fault. How much of that did Asan Deer see coming? That's the question. Oh, really well, right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, and if, yeah. if, if Asan Deer, how much did he see coming? How much did the fellowship see coming? Bear that in mind as you go through the next books. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, they're a whole a fascinating mystery of uh, a set of characters that I am, I, I'm sure you've got a, a bunch of wonderful things in store for me with them. Um, but I mean, I think maybe the funniest moment for me reading these books wasn't even, uh, it wasn't a, a, a Dakar scene, but it was when the, um, the Cor uh, Cori, Coriani or, or the- uh, Coriathane, yeah. Uh, yeah, the the Korea thing. They come to take the uh, their prism uh, or their is it? A, it's a prism uh, stone. It's a big crystal. Right, right. And um, they think they see uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the Pravians, and then Sephir is just thinking to himself, "Well, you know, if they had just asked, if they had just..." And, and then <laughs> I, I don't. I love that. I thought that was hilarious. His sort of there was a lot buried in that scene because okay. Sethir set up that illusion, right? Mm -hmm. Did you catch his little thought? If they'd met the real thing, I would have destroyed. Or like, or he did he mm -hmm. say something like, "Nothing would be where it is like right now. Every everything right it, here." Yes, yeah. <laughs> basically, yeah. if they had challenged the tower's defenses, they would not be standing. So he set up this elaborate illusion, and yeah, all they had to do was ask. That's all they had to do all these years. Uh -huh. Ask <laughs> right. fellowship or not. You have to see into their actions once again, because power speaking to power doesn't volunteer information. You have to ask for it. Mm -hmm. And if you ask for it, they might give it to you. Right. <laughs> so you can watch every interaction with the fellowship. I can safely see this. I don't like telling people before volume one, but in arc two, you see it over and over. When the fellowship, want, when you ask them, they will tell you. Right. They will tell you. You might not want to hear the answer, or it might lead you a whole lot deeper than you really want to go. It's dangerous to ask a power that grave a question, because you might get the answer. So 
when you look at the interactions with fellowship, watch for it. You'll see that moment where they're perfectly open and to answer the question until the character themselves own belief shuts them down. Mm-hmm. Where they, the character's own assumption says, you're not going to answer this or, or I'm not going to ask that or I'm falling back onto this prior belief that I have that this is impossible. Right. And you'll see the fellowship turn off then because, yeah, okay, you just decided not to ask the question. Right. You went back into your little shell of belief. You just, and it's kind of funny because you will see them in arc three push a bit to get a character ask a question. But if the character backs up into a prior assumption, they can't break free will. Mm-hmm. So you say, well, why are they so reticent or, or why don't they just tell people? Because great power does not do that. Great power leaves you your power to answer those questions yourself. Mm-hmm. So we see that playing with the fellowship constantly is how much are you willing to break your assumptions? Because if you ask them a question, it might shatter what you thought you knew. Sorry for the ding there. (laughs) Um, Yeah. I I, I sort of, uh, it, you, you saying that kind of reminds me or it, it reminds me how connected everything is, um, all the themes are in, in these, because it's very similar to how Arathon isn't going to come out and give people answers. He's going to like, like, like he, he knows he's too powerful uh, where he could have the power to. He's an initiate people. master. He right. was an initiate master at 20 years old. Yeah. You will see a bit as you read into arc three, how he got where he is, okay. what his training entailed, and it isn't an easy path. So he works a lot like the fellowship does, doesn't he? Yeah. Oh, because yeah. he has the potential to fling one grain of sand and it causes a crater. Mm-hmm. And he knows that initiate masters know that they know that words matter, intentions matter, actions matter, and they're going to self limit. And they're going to self-limit depending on who they're interacting with. So on what level is a character interacting with Arathon? Mm-hmm. So you see him push off the hero worship with Theric, but you see Lyser foster it with Deegan. Yeah. And you will see the results of that going forward. Theric says it right out when Jenna says, are you going to betray Arathon? Is he the criminal he says he is? And Theric says outright, I know he's done things that all the rumors are not false. However, he has never played me false. Right. So he bases it on the behavior and the ethic. That's what he stands on. And that's where he succeeds, where other characters will fail with Mm -hmm. interactions with a character that has an initiate mastery. (laughs) Um. I, I, I'm not sure I have too many more specific questions about any of those characters we uh, just went through, but I, I am curious, are there supporting characters that I haven't mentioned yet that you would love to uh, just, just speak about uh, briefly? Uh, a, a, any characters that you feel fit into this great kind of, pl- like this, how you're playing with their assumptions and who's going to succumb to those and who's going to kind of master those? Anyone else that you'd like to mention? Well, you have the the ship captain who survived her abuse. She was an abuse survivor. She didn't survive this book. Mm -hmm. But, you know, one of the things people say is, oh, this is such a male-oriented story. It really isn't. If you look at the array Um, of women who are surrounding the main events, and they're all different. We have the widow that's shrinking. We have the ship captain who survived her abuse and went on and struck off independent. She's she's bullying around a male crew and she's making it work. You have Maynol. Oh yeah. Has to carry the ethic. You have, of course, Alara. Right, right. Talith. You have this whole range of characters surrounding what is going on. And all of those women, and even the twins, I mean, they're gonna grow up and they're going to be signal in arc three. 
the women are real people. They aren't just cookie cutters. And there are very few of them that are just basking in the male gaze here that are just babes. They're real people. I mean, one of the most powerful scenes, I think, in Warhost was um, uh, when uh, the Lady Taylor uh, reunites with Lysair and she has doubts about his um, his claim or his uh, cause, his cause for war. I, I just thought, and then he can't, he, he knows, oh, the only way she would doubt me is he, he must have gotten in her head. It can't be anything I've done. Like, I just... I love that scene so much. I, but I love also it. he loved her too much because he said, that was my weakness. It almost right. brought down the entire edifice of I've justified everything I've done. Yeah. He said, I was willing to throw it all away for her. Three ransoms. Right. Three ransoms. <laughs> so, yeah. If he was to keep his delusions intact, she had to be destroyed. So how important, this says a lot about how important Lysair's delusions are right? and how much is the curse driving it. You don't know at this point, more of that's going to come out as the story unwinds. You know, what person is underneath of all of this? Mm -hmm. Because justice will apply to logic, compassion does not. And that was the original observation you got in Curse of the Mistwraith is compassion does not bend. Mm -hmm. Logic can't paste over when something horrific happens and people are suffering. Compassion can't do that. Empathy can't do that. It can't paste over justifications. It is, period. But justice can build a structure around itself to say, I did the right thing. Mm -hmm. And it can always find an angle, can't it? Oh, yeah. It can narrativize in the hor most horrible way. Like, oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we see the characters stand and fall on how big of a justification can they build around what it is that they're setting up to do. Now, you don't know the moral high ground. What are they defending? You think, oh, well, the Koryathe and this. You don't know what they're protecting. Right. And you won't until I'm ready to drop the hammer on that one. And the fellowship, you don't know what they're protecting until I'm ready to drop the hammer on that one. So... A lot of times you can make an assumption and say these people are bad guys or they're behaving badly or they're I don't agree with what they're doing. But unless you know where they're coming from, what are they protecting? What is the hill that they will die on? Uh -huh. And maybe it's a hill that would rip the ground out from under you if they didn't die on it. You don't know right. until you know. And again, how often do we encounter this? Mm -hmm. How often do we sit down at the peace table and really understand the intentions of the person sitting across from us? What are they afraid of? What are they protecting? What are they acting off of? Are they facing their flaws, tearing them down and rebuilding a stronger foundation or are they retreating into them? So conflicts are made of so many different vectors of force. Mm -hmm. And if you're protecting your flaws, now you're a tool for somebody else. If they mm -hmm. step onto the stage and they say, I fit your belief so perfectly. Now go kill somebody for that belief. You're just a tool for that if you don't question it. Right, right. And I mean, I think the, um, again, just to throw even more characters in here, the um, uh, Sabridian brothers, um, I think how you had Arathon and his forces basically steal their loyalty away from Lysair in the end of uh, Warhost, I thought was brilliant because, I mean, I, I'm not sure if they were basing it on the sort of, okay, well, we've sort of earned loyalty and respect from other people by not coming out right and forcing them to work with us. And so if we can show the brothers that side of us during this war and show them during this war how stupid um, or how pointless marching an army into a mountain range actually is. Branzian um, called him on that. Remember that scene? Branzian called him on that. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. The Sabridian brothers are an odd mix because their, their history, their town did not fall in the rising. So they still have a clan seat that's a fortress. 
Uh-huh. And if you look at the geography, how much of our political landscape is built by geography? If you look at where Alestron is sited, it's at the long end of a narrow, mm-hmm. narrow strait, and he's got two enemy cities sitting at the at the front of it. Right, so right. Here's this huge, powerful citadel. It's more powerful than you know because the history of that site goes way back to Paravian times. Okay. The walls of that fortress literally were built to withstand dragon fire. Okay. It is a seriously, seriously dangerous citadel. You Trying to attack it is practically impossible. Mm-hmm. Situated at this narrow, narrow strait. So in order to survive these guys to keep their shipping going because they were a major harbor, they got to go to war with their two town neighbors at the head of that strait pretty regularly. And they got to withstand all of the pressure because they're not running on town law. They're running on the old law, which is charter law. And this is going to become signal as time goes on. So they're a very warmongering race. So of course they hate Arathon, of course, but they're questioning Lysair. They're the only allies that are questioning Lysair all the way along. And you realize that you knew from the duel that took place in ships when early in tests Arathon with the sword. Mm-hmm. And early and drops it on Arathon that the Kaeth Danan tests their princes with their lives if need be. You have to understand the shadow behind the throne concept. The Kaeth Danan are the royal conscience. And this is not a monarchy in the way that you think of it. Mm-hmm. Those guys could depose a high king. No problem. If he's morally defective, your Kaeth Danan can kick him out. And that's what Erlian was doing, was testing the fiber of this sanctioned prince. And if Arathon had resorted to shadows of sorcery to save his life, save him, save his limb, save his health, he would have failed. Mm-hmm. And that was when Arathon finally disarmed him and said, why? Why did you do this? And he's dropped this bomb that we use our lives to test princesses. So understand that the Sabridian had big grounds not to like Lysair because he killed Meno. He killed right, him. right. So they're fighting on Lysair's side, but they don't really, Lysair doesn't hold their loyalty and they made that dead plain. Mm-hmm. We do not hold our loyalty. We're going after the sorcerer because we don't like him. He wrecked our armory. We're a warmongering race. We have to be because otherwise we'd be dead. So watch for this going forward. These characters are going to come back. Okay. (laughs) All of them are going to come back. And what happens at the end of this book, it's going to come back. And you will see more of that Citadel and more of, so there's a lot of things going at play here. Um, It's really the first hint, the first beginning of the the clue that you're not running on town law or standard law or what you assume to be European monarchy. Mm Mm-hmm. But their high kings and queens are not running on monarchy. And the clue was all the way back in Curse of the Mystery. When in the glossary it says 1,500 and something high king in the glossary. Uh Add up the years. First age, third age rather, year one is the beginning of crown rule. It's the beginning of humanity on Athera. Third age, year one. So basically you're talking 5,000, three, 30, uh, 30, um, 3,000 years. 3657 is the opening of curse. You add up how many high kings there have been since year one, you come up with an average of four years. Right. <laughs> right yeah. The average high king only held the crown for four years. Now, obviously, some had months and some had years, but the average was four years. This is not hereditary monarchy in any sense of the word. Not at all. And if you notice, mayors rule for life. Okay. So there's this massive clue plant here that, that high kings and queens do not. Whoa. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. And Lysair has no... Lysair's carrying his own assumptions with him, which are much like ours. 
So uh -huh. yeah, everybody going, I don't want to read another fantasy with monarchy. You're reading a very anti-colonial book if you, uh -huh. and you you will not escape that fact by arc three. Okay. <laughs> and this was not popular back in 1993. Mm -hmm. This wasn't even in the conversation in 1993. Sure, sure. Um, um, so yeah, it's really kind of fun because you're going to realize if you had read what was on the page with none of your assumptions in a place, you would see a whole different world, mm -hmm. literally, than what you're being presented. So yeah, don't worry. I'm going to break those assumptions one by one by one. Great, great. <laughs> I it, that's the that's the most fun when a when a book does not follow the assumptions because otherwise why 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 am I reading it <laughs> you know like what <laughs> yeah well you know we all start out with the product of our upbringing but how many people step outside of that right the information is there we can we have the internet we have books we have history books. We have the ability to understand other cultures, but how many people actually bother? Right. Or do we prefer to stay wrapped up in our own little cocoon and never look outside of what our parents told us was true? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I don't have a, too much else to add. Um, I, I guess I... Uh, maybe one more question, if you don't mind. I, I don't want to keep you for too long, uh, but um, I'm curious about, uh, I haven't really read a ton of other reviews or especially from the time um, that these books were coming out. Um, I'm curious if you've seen any particularly like strange reactions to these characters um, th that we've been speaking about, like from the fans, a anyone saying things about them, that was just like totally not what you expected the takeaway to be, but for some reason people were, were interpreting things in a certain way, a anything like that. All the time. Okay. <laughs> because I started out with a very classical appearing trope. If they're unable to drop their assumptions, if they're carrying too much, I mean, to me, what a reader gets out of a book has nothing to do with what I wrote, really. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. It has everything to do with what they bring to the page. Sure. So I can put the words down and I can assume what I put there, but it may not compute to somebody that's determined that the tall blonde guy has to be the hero right. <laughs> or that there aren't enough women in this book. And so <laughs> therefore it's, it's terribly chauvinistic or pick your poison, you know, okay, yeah. say whatever they care to say. But when you look at whatever they say, that to me is really, it has to do with where they're coming from. It has to do with a facet of their own identity they're unwilling to drop. And Curse of the Mistwraith was designed very specifically to chuck those people out and get rid of them. Uh -huh. Because if you assume the tall blind guy is the hero by chapter four or so, you're going to be darn pissed off. Yeah. Because he's not acting like the hero anymore. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Or not the one that you were brought up to believe if you if you believe that the the dark little sorcerer that's evil is evil. The, uh -huh. the book's going to throw you right off the page. So yeah, if you can't, if you start reading these books and you can't finish them, it's because your assumptions got in the way or it's just your physical makeup. You didn't like complex language and you wanted a simple oh, story where you're told what to think. <laughs> I don't want a story where you're told what to think. This whole book is predicated on learning to think for yourself. Mm -hmm. Stand on your own two feet make an opinion, it may get busted. And what do you do with that? Do you get disappointed and throw the book and make a dent in the wall because the book made you angry because it didn't do what you wanted it to do? Or do you rebuild your foundation and say, what am I really reading here? So it was designed to skim off people who refused to budge off their assumptions. And the other reason people bounce off this is people who cannot visualize Okay. Well, yeah, who are aphantasia, they cannot visualize because I'm a visual artist and I brought all that experience to the page. I want you immersed in this experience, all facets of it, emotionally, visually, the feeling of what it's like to be on a ship offshore. I know because I've done it. 
I want to take you there. I want to take you out of your armchair and give you that experience. So you can feel what it's like to be on a badly rigged boat on a lee shore, leaving ships of Marior on a half finished rig that isn't performing too well. You know, I wanted to deliver that experience because not everybody can go there and do that. So I tried to take what I know and put it on the page, but some people just can't go there because their brain is not wired that way. Sure. Okay. Or they insist that all the language should be transparently simple. <laughs> When you get to ARC 4 and you understand that I'm starting to write about things that occur outside the envelope, language does not go there. Okay. I had to use words to describe what was happening and make it totally crystal clear because I'm stepping into an experience in, in many cases that has very little resemblance to physical reality at all. And it threads through everything that is. So it isn't like you're going to be off in left field. I'm going to stage you and get you there. But if I didn't start with enough precision of language to carry that in book one, it would be a horrible cold bath of water at book four. Mm -hmm. okay. Or arc four, rather, excuse me. So there were a lot of decisions, and it may not click with what you want to read right now, or it may not click with your belief system, or it may not click with your personal identity. You know, I've had people write something and go, oh, this person, you know, this book is prejudice against so-and-so. And I'm thinking, well, you didn't read too far. <laughs> There's a character that's exactly what you're complaining isn't in this particular scene. So, oh. that, <laughs> yeah. so it's personal free will. They can think what they want to think. It's their experience to bring that to the page. Sure. But the people who carry too much of their own <clears throat> rigid viewpoints or rigid identity entering this book are not going to survive it. And that's for a reason. Mm -hmm. Because it was designed to work with critical thinking. It was designed to work with busting assumptions. It was designed to, do you have the flexibility to admit you are wrong? Do you have the ability to question what this character says? So it isn't what is happening on the page so much as here's a character making a statement of what happened on the page, but what was their experience? What were their blind spots? What were their weaknesses? And what assumptions are they making? So you have to be willing to think a bit to take apart what you're actually reading this book was designed for that because we're spoon fed the news every day mm -hmm. and we have wars and we have misunderstandings and we have people killing people over things where we did not question deep enough. We did not look wide enough. We did not try to understand. All right. Uh, well, I, I think on that note, uh, I might wrap it up here if that's all right with you. Um, it's all right with me. All right. Uh, well, thank you again so much for uh, coming on uh, to talk about ARC 2, uh, the series in general, um, but especially so many of these just wonderful side characters that do so much to play around with the, the ideas and the assumptions that we have going in. And I guess, I mean, as readers, we, the audience is along with few characters than we are with characters like Arathon or uh, or Lysayer because we're having to make up for ourselves or make up our own minds about who, whether or not we can actually trust Arathon, uh, whether or not Lysayer has any kind of justice behind his his reasons. I, I, I don't know. It's It's a wonderful kind of, it's a wonderful experience to go through while reading books that it's it's just totally different than anything else I've, I've ever read. So thank I think you. there's an important concept to take away from this. And that is that we have from our youngest years, the erroneous assumption that one leader can lead in all circumstances. Mm -hmm. We look to one person to follow. And that is a huge mistake because if you look at the complexity of the issues that face us, you wouldn't want Patton at the peace table. General Patton is perfect <laughs> to do what he did in World War II, but you would not want him in the peace table, would you? No. Yeah. Still. So this erroneous assumption that fantasy brings us up on, worse than even any other genre, is that one person can lead and do it all. And that's false. You need a different set of skills depending which problem is in front of you. There's times when you don't want compassion leading. It will be a flaw. Mm -hmm. There are times when you want justice to take the forefront, but it's the wrong move. 
in another circumstance. So the whole attitude of we really need a village, we need a, 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 a series of people with skills to negotiate a major problem, a world scale problem. And so watch for that going forward of where a character's strength becomes their failure. Under what circumstances is that going to be a weakness and not a strength at all? So this erroneous thing that one person can do it all, I don't think so. I think we're each geared to a different set of skills. And the, the more we face global problems, the more we have to recognize that. That one person can't do it all. It takes a village. Mm -hmm. It takes a select group of people. And knowing which one should step forward in what circumstance is very important. All right. Uh well, uh, thank you again so much, uh, and I, I can't. I hope to have you on further down the road once I uh, read more uh, or get further in the series. Uh, I also plan. I haven't read uh, to ride Hell's Chasm yet, but I uh, plan on reading that in the near future. Um, but yeah, I, I again loving the series so much, and thank you again for. Well, thank you for having me, and it's so wonderful to see people enjoying the series for what it is. It's finally finding its audience, and that's a big satisfaction for me in that because so much went into it. So I look forward to seeing where you end up going forward. Thank you. Bye.